click. Uh, so this is a this is a work that Andre Andreas and I did um, in the last few months. So just some background first. Like on the physics side at CERN, we do our computing on this thing called the Worldwide LHC Computing Grid. Uh, CERN forms the tier zero, so we have around 135 petabytes of disk replicated twice and almost 400 petabytes of tape. And we, for our scientific data taking, we still add 50 petabytes per year. In addition to this, like around around CERN, there are 14 tier one centers with high speed optical links to CERN and around 160 tier two centers. These are universities and labs around the world. Um, in total, this makes around a million CPU cores processing something like 2 million jobs per day. We have around one exabyte of storage globally with around one terabit uh, total internal connectivity. And for example, last year we transferred 300 petabytes around on our WLCG, our Worldwide LHC Compute Grid. Now this whole thing on the storage side is powered by some open source storage software all developed within our high energy physics HEP community. These are things like Dcache, DPM, EOS, Storm, XrootD. These are all site storage solutions. Uh, protocols that are used are like HTTP, XRoot, and GSI FTP. To transfer between sites, we have a thing called the File Transfer Service, or FTS, and this does third-party transfers between sites, um, and it schedules these transfers according to network constraints. And then we have something called Rusio, which is what, what we call a data orchestrator. So it places the data uh, and interacts with the file transfer service according to different policies. We also have, I don't know how good that this works, but we have like a video of this kind of global uh, data transfers, um, lots in Europe, lots in North America, lots in Asia, lots in Australia, also in Africa. Um, next slide. So this brings to like what this work is about. So in the next few years, the high luminosity LHC data taking is going to increase our demands on storage. So we'll need to be taking something like 500 petabytes per year by 2028. And open source storage software like Ceph has compelling features of maturity. So we want to ask, it, it begs the question, what role that they'll play in future physics storage systems. Um, however, it's known that like off the shelf software misses some high level features that we have. So one solution would be to layer our high energy physics specific gateways on top of open source storage. So here in this presentation, I'm presenting a novel combination, CephFS plus EOS, a, so a software written at CERN. So I don't have to go into detail on what Ceph is. It's a popular part of the open infrastructure stack. Um, lots of sites have it anyway, so maybe it's useful to put some small thin layer on top to then be able to expose a university's infrastructure to the to the LHC computing grid. Um, CephFS, I don't have to go into detail what it is. It's an NFS-like clustered file system used for home directories, HPC scratch areas, or shared storage. Uh, it's scale out. It uses Rados underneath. It can do replication or erasure coding. Um, and it's also read after write consistent, which is important. And it has and the clients, the MDS delegate capabilities to the clients so that they can either do buffered I/O or asynchronous, asynchronous buffered I/O or synchronous uh, as needed. Going very quickly through this overview stuff. At CERN, we've had CephFS in production since 2017. Uh, currently, we have three different use cases: HPC scratch areas, uh, where we do triple replication. These are these are OSDs co-located on some compute nodes of a, of a HPC cluster. We have OpenStack Manila used massively at CERN. So this is again replication, one petabyte uh, usable capacity at the moment. Uh, and then we use it also also for some uh, on-prem groupware solutions. So we have Ceph OSDs co-located on OpenStack hypervisors and then we run some erasure coded CephFS there. These and more than 30 petabytes of other Ceph clusters have been ro robust and performing. Uh, in any kind of disaster scenario, everything seems to work. After infrastructure outages, the data is still fine. Our users are, are not, are the, the failures are basically transparent to our users. And we've also been through three procurement cycles now, um, and we just replace and rebalance that data and everything works great. 
However, CephFS, like I mentioned, misses some features that are essential to high energy physics, like some authentication mechanisms, which are like Psi tokens, uh, X509, Kerberos, also some very uh, feature rich quota and access control uh, things that are required in high energy physics. The storage protocols like X, HTTP, XRootD, and third party copy I mentioned before. Um, and also, in this use case, we don't have experience at the, at the data taking, what we call data taking rates, which is between 10 to 100 gigabytes per second streaming for, for days at a time without stop. So EOS is a, is a large scale storage written at CERN for physics. And we use that we have this in production for many years now at CERN and we have 300 petabytes of capacity available at the moment. It's implemented in a storage framework called XRootD. Um, basically, the, there's a namespace, which is present, there's a namespace implemented by a thing called QuarkDB, which is a kind of consensus distributed raft cluster um, with RocksDB behind. Uh, FSTs are like the OSDs. They store data either locally or they can also gateway remote storage. And then MGM is like the MDS. It, it caches metadata and maps file names to inodes. Um, so actually, it's very straightforward for us to use CephFS behind the scenes of an of a, of a EOS cluster simply by tricking EOS into using it as a local file system. So all the redundancy and high availability is de delegated to the CephFS layer, and we configure our EOS storage to store with just a single copy. Um, in case any of these kind of FSC gateways uh, fail, you can move you can move the, 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 the virtual FSC file system that's on CephFS to another node to easily recover in case of failure. So we did a proof of concept of this. Um, we, took, we took eight large, very large new machines. So they're dual Xeon, not very much RAM, 192 gigs of RAM. They have 100 gigabit ethernet, 60 14 terabyte drives each, and two uh, one terabyte SSDs. So the RAM, I said it's not very much, it's roughly three gigabytes per, per spinning disk. This is different from what we run in production right now. We run actually 96 12 terabyte drives with 192 gigs of RAM. Um, but at that ratio, it's really getting to be too little RAM for, for the Ceph OSDs. Everything that we buy, because we have hundreds of petabytes, it has to be optimized by price per, per, um, price per terabyte. The Ceph backend was Octopus version 15.2.8, and we configured, so we had OSDs installed on this hardware. For the MON, MGR, and MDS, we didn't, we weren't particularly benchmarking metadata performance, so we just put them onto some VM somewhere else in the data center. Uh, we have the metadata pool on the SSDs, though, and then we have a few different CephFS data pools testing three different erasure coding layouts. 4 plus 2, 8 plus 2, and 16 plus 2. And to try to make things fair, we had a number of placement groups so that the number of placement groups per OSD was roughly equal. So like 50, 40, 40 for these different layouts. And then we used the upmap balancer to make sure everything was, was balanced. Um, in the test, okay, this is this is like just to explain how it works. We did 16 megabyte, if, if suppose an object was 16 megabytes, this is sent to the primary OSD, HDD1 here, who then does the work to, to split this into the different pieces and the erasure coding pieces. Uh, we, in our test, we varied the object size to see what impact it has on performance. And then we did different kinds of tests. So what we call a backend test was just native CephFS benchmarking, uh, where we ran on, on a separate set of nodes connected to the same switch, also with 100 gigabit networking, we just ran DD to see how quickly that we could really pump files into this FFS. And then we also, after layering our EOS software on top, we did, we did uh, kind of benchmarks of this layered indirect writing. In all cases, each client node is running 10 in parallel, and we're always writing two gigabyte files. And then they're just looping like this. Um, this is a, a larger picture of the setup, just to say that when we were doing the backend test, again, we were DDing directly from a mount 
looking up the MDS where to write and then writing to the to the OSDs. When we were doing the, that's what we call the back end test, the front end test. Okay, we have EOS on top, so we have to ask an EOS name server called EOS MGM, this is like the EOS MDS, where it should write, and then that maps to one of the FSTs that is mounted CephFS, and then it writes to, to Ceph. So some backend streaming numbers. On this cluster, we were able to, so we vary here on the left, um, this is streaming read performance. We vary the number of clients nodes running, and for up to three nodes running, we were getting linear increase in the throughput that we were able to read. So it was like four and a half gigabytes per second, then nine, then 14. Um, but then it started to, to saturate. So it saturated around 20 gigabytes per second of reading performance. Writing, we actually did better. Um, so around six gigabytes per second per node added to the cluster until it saturated around 33 to 34 gigabytes per second. This is with four plus two erasure coding on CephFS. We noticed something interesting, which was that as the OSDs got full, the performance dropped. The right performance here, we showed that up to 50% full, everything was, was working very well. But then as, as we got to 75 and the 90% full, we, we saw up to a 30% performance cut in the streaming write performance. It correlated with increased IO weight on the disks, so we just assume this is just the the blue store allocators spending more time having to fit these blocks onto the disk and lots more random seeks to write. Um, here we varied the erasure coding layout. We went from four plus two to eight plus two to sixteen plus two to see how that impacts the streaming write performance. Uh, in CephFS, the default is four megabytes. But on this particular use case that we were running, this didn't give us the optimal performance. By, by increasing to uh, say 64 megabytes and then doing 16 plus two erasure coding for 128 megabytes object sizes and doing 16 plus two erasure coding, we could get 420 megabytes per, second per, per write stream. So remember we're doing 80 streams in parallel always. So this is per stream performance. And that was the, that was the optimal. Um, on the read, ha read side, it was similar. Okay, the object size influenced the performance that we could get reading. And we really could get, for the small object sizes, uh, we, could, we could only get maybe 200 megabytes per second. And then with 128 megabyte objects, this is the large yellow plot here, 128 meg megabyte objects, we could get, um, we could get, uh, up to like 380 or 400 megabytes per second. We were also varying the block size. So in our client application, we could configure whether we wanted one, one megabyte or 128 megabytes to read. And by increasing the, the block size, we could increase the read performance quite a bit. Um, we did notice, however, in writing some quite serious write performance tails. So by tail, I mean, you know, you have the distribution of writes looks like this distribution that's in the top left corner here. 19, or the average time will be some peak of a plot like this, but then you'll, you can measure the 99th percentile or the maximum time for the, for the slowest transfer. Um, for the small objects, uh, the, 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 the mean, which is shown as the gray in this plot here, was, always, was, was quite reasonable. But the 99th percentile or 100th percentile was, was maybe double the, the mean. However, when we got to the 64 megabyte objects and 128 megabyte objects, the, we had very huge long tail distribution. So we were waiting. The slowest transfer was really like, like uh, maybe 10 times, the, 10 times the average, which is quite poor for our data taking type scenario. On the reading side, this didn't, this tail, these long tails were not so apparent. Um, and even with the long, with the largest objects and the largest block sizes, uh, the, the tails were, were minimized. So for reading, we can do, we can, we can still have these uh, huge objects, huge IOs. Now that's all, that's all like backend performance 
CephFS alone. Now we go to CephFS and we layer our gateways on top, our high energy physics gateways. Um, in this plot, okay, we start at the left with four plus two erasure coding, four megabyte objects, and we have a certain performance, which is the gray, okay? We add our EOS front end. The average speed takes is roughly the same, okay? The average throughput is basically the same. So we don't have a performance penalty to add our EOS front end. However, the tails increase substantially. We got huge 99th and, and, and max transfer times. Um, so what we did to work around this was on the client side, we started throttling the bandwidth. So by throttling down to 26 gigabytes per second total, or which was 325 megabytes per second per transfer, we could bring those tails back down to almost like native CephFS. And then if we increase that slightly, we got started increasing the tails again. So we see that was like a sweet spot for this, for this uh, particular use case and cluster. But we really need this client side throttling to, to protect uh, from long tails. In read performance, okay, we have, we started with here, we start with uh, native Ceph, Ceph alone with four plus two erasure coding, four megabyte objects, one megabyte reads, okay? We can optimize CephFS alone by increasing, so we still do four plus two erasure coding, but we increase to 16 megabyte objects and we do eight megabyte reads, okay? This decreases the transfer time Per, per transfer. So this is showing you that by playing with CephFS uh, file layouts, you can gain a lot of performance. And then by we add our EOS front end on top and we got even slightly better performance, okay? This is due to um, the IOs being better scheduled somehow by being, by being shielded by, by uh, the EOS front end. It's not a huge effect, but it was noticeable. And there were no long tails for reading. So that come, that's the end of the of the the raw benchmarks. Now I'll talk a little bit about what we did, what we had to, what we observed on the Ceph side. So on this large cluster, or this relatively large cluster with huge boxes and very fast network, um, even just while Rados benching this cluster, we found that the Rados clients themselves were throttling themselves because there's something in there's a there's a client parameter called object or in flight op bytes, and it's limiting to 100 megabytes by default. But on this cluster with like so many spinning disks and so much network throughput, we needed to increase the in-flight bytes uh, so we could get the best Rados bench performance by increasing this to one gigabyte. Um, this was of course only for like user mode clients. We were doing some fuse tests as well and some Rados benches on the side. It doesn't apply to the kernel staff of us that, that, that uh, does this. I don't know what it actually limits to, but it's something larger than the default Rados client. Now, Something interesting that uh, that came up during this is that EOS software has an internal FSCK um, function where it's always scanning the files. It's always hammering the MDS. So the MDS is always having to load cache and then trim the cache of thousands of inodes uh, and stay underneath the MDS cache memory limit. We found just by observation that each inode is consuming around three kilobytes. So if we had a 64 gigabyte MDS, this would hold around 21 million inodes, but that's, we need, we need, we have file systems with something like a billion files, so it doesn't all fit in memory. And actually this FSCK was very, it could very easily cause the MDS to go out of memory because the, I, the MDS in this version that we tested will very happily hand out caps and load inodes to clients at something like 50 kilohertz um, but then when it comes time to trim its memory, it asks for those MDS capabilities back from the clients, but only at maybe five kilohertz by default. So this was, this contributes to something like one gigabyte per second of inode cache growth. Uh, and you very quickly, within a few seconds, your, your MDS goes out of memory. So this was all fixable by changing the tuning parameters of Ceph, some caps recall tunings. And the, we worked with Patrick upstream to, to get some increased, some increased rate of CAPS recall. And there's a PR there linked. Um, and this actually works really well. The numbers that are now the default in Ceph actually work really well for all of our use cases. 
And there's also a new capabilities acquisition, a caps throttle to prevent this, maybe even without tuning these, uh, without paying so much attention to tuning them. Um, now, something that's unsolved is that during our testing, one day out of the blue, the performance, the right performance of the cluster dropped from something like 25 gigabytes per second, which was the normal, to under five gigabytes per second. And there was no changes to the cluster, nothing obvious. Um, we confirmed this uh, like in our front end testing and also with Rados Bench. And then the root cause was found to be just one sick spinning disk in the cluster. Maybe it had a poor SATA connection, but we could observe by measuring that disk itself Directly, we saw something like two seconds of latency doing small IOs. Uh, there were no IO errors, no smart errors. The drive was just slow. So a very quick fix was simply to stop the OSD, stop the system CTL, stop the OSD process. Immediately, the right performance went back up to 25 gigabytes per second. And then, of course, the data was backfilled somewhere else. So we want to find a way to better identify these kind of uh, six sick drives, I guess we can call them. Um, we have lots of internal metrics. Uh, we could actually find this drive right away just by running Ceph OSD perf and sorting by the op commit latency. Um, but uh, we it would be we've, we're working ourselves just now on trying to find how what what is worth which kind of threshold of uh, of op latency is worth alarming or worth warning the unit the user. Um, you know, in Ceph, we already warn about high network latencies, and we can we, we monitor the smart status as even predict the status. But I think we can also look at the anomalous op commit latencies. So coming to the end, so this proof of concept demonstrated that we can get uh, per client node up to four gigabytes per second uh, reading and writing, and it works very well for our use case. Uh, we filled a CephFS up to 95% capacity, up, actually. Uh, you have to really balance your cluster with UpMap to, to be able to do this. Um, but for anyone that wants to, that dares to fill a cluster that much, we will just want to make it clear that operating a cluster when it's nearly full is very hazardous. We have a performance cutoff that we observed, the Rados level, probably caused by, by disk fragmentation. Maybe if we use BlockDB on Flash, it, it would help. Actually, we didn't even use BlockDB on Flash in this case. And then, of course, you have to reserve adequate spare capacity to handle any kind of failures, like one rack free or at least one host free. Um, on the network utilization side, so we have these very fast network. We want to make sure that we're using the network. We found that write performance is limited by the network connectivity. So we didn't see any CPU or disk IO bottlenecks. Um, read performance, however, was probably limited by seeking. We measured that with this basic Ceph erasure coding, it basically doubles the network throughput based on what the user is actually writing. Um, so nine gigabytes per second inbound translates to like five gigabytes to get a local disk output and five gigabytes sent outbound to other nodes in the cluster. We could afford to double the the double the network connectivity on these nodes to thereby saturate all of the available disk IO on these particular nodes. So we could use public and cluster network isolation, which we didn't. We also found that when we were doing concurrent writing and reading, the writes were taking priority. So in this, uh, and this is actually what we want, so it's okay. If we have, if we're doing data taking, we want the write reads to be deprioritized. But if you leave the I.O. prioritization just up to Ceph, um, then, then uh, the, the red is just showing that in these various, in these various tests, okay, the writes were taking the, the most of the bandwidth. Uh, I asked at a previous meeting, like, it would be interesting if we could actually tune this directly so that we could, we could specify by policy how we want the I.O.s. Uh, to be prioritized. Of course, we can do this in our front end as well, so maybe that's a better, that's another path. Um, our front end, so this is like a case, if anybody needs to put a front end in front of CephFS, you can sh you can see that it has mar marginal impact on the overall performance compared to native the native backend Rados. Uh, you might get tails, for example, like we've seen. Um, and Going forward, we we might want to like co-locate everything on the same boxes rather than putting 
the our gateways on separate boxes and then connecting to a remote cluster, we might want to put everything locally. However, we rely on the kernel performance and there's like a well-known bug that if you put a CFS kernel mount, if you mount local OSDs, uh, this can cause a kernel deadlock under some scenarios if there's a high memory pressure. It would be safe to use a fuse mount or access with libcfs, but we've found uh, in experiments that libcfs performs quite poorly. And I think that this was mentioned this, uh, this week that there's a, a, a global lock and probably this is why we see poor libcfs performance. Um, so coming to conclusions, uh, these pieces of software, CFFS and EOS, are easily stackable and give excellent performance on the high density commodity disk server and 100 gig network. CFFS is extremely reliable, high performance and flexible with tunable QoS. Um, and it has, as we know, a large and active user community beyond our physics communities. Um, and then in this stack, the reason why we layer this, of course, is that we have all of the tools that we need for our use cases, like strong authentication, the remote protocols that we need in our, in our applications, um, also like fine-grained resource control, fine-grained quotas according to our user communities. And then you can also, we've built other services on top of EOS, like we have CERNBox, which is a sync and share thing, and also we have a new open source tape software called CERN Tape Archive, which is linked to this, so we can think of putting this all all these pieces together. Um, what are we doing now? So I won't go into too much detail, but we're doing, we're now testing this sort of thing. We want to start, we will start testing this in production to get, to see if we can really have real life gains in usability, performer, performance and operations. Um, it also removes some limitations that we have on the EOS side. And then we have on the, on the like, thinking about how this can be implemented, even optimize the implementation, we're considering how to unify the namespaces and localize the IO so that when we use one namespace between CFFS and EOS, but also um, do the IO like so that the clients, they don't have to go through a, a special EOS client. They could just use a native CFFS client on, the, on our large batch systems. And that's it. Thanks. I had, a, I had a quick question about the um, the read versus write performance. I was a little bit surprised to see that the, your your write or sorry your read um, throughput seemed to uh, taper off before the writes did. And you mentioned um, uh, the the seek latency on the disks being the the likely culprit. That's our, um, that's our guess, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's 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 generally right, but that's only part of the story. Um, did you try playing with the the read ahead? on the setting on the kernel client? We didn't. We just need to you, default. Yeah. Usually what happens is there are only a certain number of reads and flight it only reads so far ahead. And so you are waiting for the the arms to move around for those like whatever hundred megs or whatever it is in front of your, your read position. Um and so there's some built in latency there, but if you just extend the read ahead, then it can like fetch that data ahead of time and then you can get much much more I mean that will that will help if if things are laid out linear if, if things are laid out linearly line, linearly according to how yeah. we're reading them. Yeah. But we're but we're thinking that actually that read ahead can be okay when we when we write things are going in a in, like they're going sequentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when we read back, maybe we're not reading back at the exact same order. That's right. So okay. Maybe it's yeah. Random. Yeah. That only it only really helps if you have really big files. <laughs> Anyway, something to take a look at. Really, really big files. Yeah, yeah. But also we have, remember, we have like 80 clients reading. So they might, so the allocator is yeah. always picking like the next file on the disk when you're writing. But then when you read those back, yeah, it's, there's the it's kind of a likely that you get the exact yeah. same order. Right. So you, have to, you have to seek yeah. around, yeah. Yeah, so increasing the read ahead just means that you can have more um, OSDs busy moving around and reading data at a time. So in theory, your read should be able to saturate your overall network capacity or whatever. So you should get more than than your right um, if you have enough read ahead. But anyway. Yeah, we'll try that. We'll try. Cool. Pretty cool.
There's a question in the chat. I don't have the chat in my. It's uh, do you see the use case for CephFS snapshots in your specific environment in the future? Uh, so yeah, not not for the data taking scenario like I'm describing here, not for the high throughput, but we layer like in the same storage systems we layer on top um like sync and share like own cloud which is behind cernbox and for that yes we use snapshots extensively uh we use snapshots to keep the older versions of the of the files and the you know the, the analyses working in project in, in progress and we're midway through implementing this right now and we've kind of you know with a with a Snapshots are different than Dropbox-like things. You don't have a Dropbox, which is like uh, snapshots are more like that. The what's the macOS thing called? I forget. Where you can like slide the snapshot right to it, where everything is all in a point in time. Um, but for time the machine. sync and share, yeah, time machine. So, but for sync and share, you want per file versions, um, and that's where that's where we could see like m more effective use of CFS snapshots instead of having, we, we kind of have to hack file versions into snapshots, which is a bit weird. We end up using a lot of uh, indirect soft links to the files. Anyway, yes, we will be using snapshots a lot in the next, in, in the upcoming use cases. <laughs> 